Hello, everyone. My name is Sergey Pronin. I'm a technical product manager here at Percona. And today we'll talk to you about Percona XDB cluster operator and some architecture decisions that we made while we were building it. So let's begin. Um, first of all, let's talk about the operator itself. So uh, first of all, why we started the operator, why Percona jumped into the operator namespace and so on. Um, the decision is purely uh, customer driven, right? We see more and more customers, they want to move their databases to containers. And it, it is more like a historical thing, right? So it all started with uh, bare metal servers and then uh, VMs appeared, virtual machi machines, and then containers appeared when businesses required uh, to deliver code faster and ship things faster and pack things more densely, uh, people started to use uh, containers. And when you have 100 or 1,000 or even more containers, you need something to orchestrate and to manage them. And here is where Kubernetes comes in, right? Kubernetes is just the orchestrator for containers, and uh, it automates out a lot of day-to-day -day routine related to containers itself. And nowadays, when someone says, okay, we want to start our container journey, get rid of our huge old-fashioned mainframe and use all the new bells and whistles, um, when people think about containers, people already think about, okay, it's Kubernetes, right? Now, operators, even when you have everything set up with Kubernetes, you manage your containers, uh, you still need to manage the application which is packed in the uh, container itself. And uh, when you have hundreds of containers which uh, are managed well by the orchestrator, you still have the problem where you need to put all these things in the containers together so that they interact nicely with each other, especially when you talk about something complex as a database. And that is where operators jump in. Right, so operators, what they do is they just automate out and simplify all the day-to-day -day routines related to the application in the containers on Kubernetes. So operator is just a piece of code which helps you to orchestrate your uh, application deployment and management on Kubernetes. So it's uh, for for such thing as a database, it's a uh, wise move to use operator if you want to manage the database on Kubernetes. And the fourth bullet here says Percona database as a service. W what I mean by that is uh, at Percona world, we have a better version of uh, our DBAS database as a service. And uh, it is open source. Uh, you can deploy it in the cloud, in prem, whatever you want. And uh, what's going on in the background that our DBAS deploys the database using our operators and deploys them obviously on Kubernetes. So it is a strategic strategic move for us to invest more in the operators so that our DBAS can thrive and help users to manage their databases easily where they want them. Um, let's talk about Procona Extra DB cluster itself and uh, the operator. So. Percona Extra Deep Cluster, or PXC, is a drop-in replacement for uh, MySQL Enterprise. Uh, it runs with Galera for, uh, and it is it has HA capabilities out of the box. Um, and I will talk about it a bit later. But re regarding the operator, the operator is free and open source, as I believe everything in Percona. Uh, the latest release was just recently on the 26th of April. So we uh, develop it a lot and uh, we introduce new features, fix bugs, and uh, with the help of the community, we move our operator to the levels where it can be used in production by huge enterprises. And it, it, it already is. Um, if we look at the high level features, um, we have Easy scaling out of the box, so you can add remove nodes, add remove proxies, 
uh, vertical scaling if you need to add more resources all can be done through the operator we have smart update in it which means that uh, you don't need to take care of the upgrades of your database uh, minor version uh, of your database like my mysql 571 will upgrade will be upgraded automatically to 572 for example right we support both 57 and 80 so it's cutting edge by design and we also have backups with point in time recovery uh, why it is important well backups is always important but point in time recovery is more important than if you want to reduce your um, uh, recovery time objective um, so you want point in time recovery to be there to get to the latest state or to the latest transaction latest date and time that that is possible and i believe right now it is the only my sql compatible operator which provides point in time recovery which is great and there are lots of other features uh, we have great documentation you can read it all on our website and uh, it's pretty well documented in github as well so let's talk about architecture quickly on architecture no surprises uh, we try to use Kubernetes primitives as much as possible, but it all starts with the Kubernetes cluster user and the operator. Um, operator is just the set of custom resource definitions, which in Kubernetes world allow you to extend the Kubernetes uh, API so that you can add more and more functionality on it without going into the code level. and uh, uh, also, it is role-based access control, service accounts, and, and the pod, which does the magic from the operator perspective. And then the user says, okay, I want to have the database up and running. And to do that, the user creates a custom resource. Custom resource is just manifest, a YAML manifest file where all the things are uh, described, like all the configuration, how many nodes do I want, what's the version, uh, what's the upgrade policy? Where do I want to store my backups? It's all in one manifest, and the user just throws it at the operator through the Kubernetes API, and then operator picks it up and creates the stateful set uh, for PXC itself, for recording through DB cluster, and the stateful set for uh, proxy if the user wants it. And the stateful sets are backed up by uh, PVCs, uh, which is persistent volume claims, uh, which is the mapping to real storage outside of the Kubernetes. So it's kind of standard thing. And also we can create the service in front of a proxies, a Kubernetes service, which can be translated into the load balancer on the cloud. So it's all working out of the box. Um, let's jump into decisions, uh, which we made while we were building the operator. So first of all, and the most important question, I believe why PXC, why we decided to go with Percona Extra DB cluster? Well, for Percona Extra DB cluster is just Galera plus uh, MySQL. And uh, when we started this operator journey, we started thinking, okay, uh, if we want to build the operator uh, for deploying our for deploying MySQL on uh, Kubernetes, what should we use, right? Why why cannot we use Procona Server for MySQL, which is like an enterprise grade uh, solution already? Well, there are a few reasons. First, we wanted we didn't want to play with um, uh, HA and implement the will. As I said, EXC already has all high availability capabilities built in, right? And as it uses Galera, uh, it comes with the synchronous replication. And synchronous replication means uh, data consistency in all the times, right? So all your transaction uh, transactions are written simultaneously to all the nodes and committed there. And uh, in Kubernetes world, where you have nodes come and go, it's pretty ephemeral. It is crucial uh, to maintain data consistency. That is why synchronous replication uh, is uh, a good choice, right? Not all applications require synchronous replication. We understand that, but 
we wanted to cover as much ground as possible. So we decided, okay, we want inference replication in place uh, right away. Um, nowadays, we see that group replication from Oracle MySQL is coming into play and uh, it's, all it's also synchronous and it is a really good solution. But when we started building the operator, it was not there, it was not that mature. And uh, I will talk about group replication a bit later um, in my talk, so we can go through that. Okay, let's start with uh, problem statement, decisions, and uh, how we solve the problem that uh, we, we stayed there. So first of all, proxies, right? Uh, why do we want proxies? Obviously, the first thing is load balancing, right? If you have a database cluster, uh, you need to balance the queries from one node to another. And obviously, you also need to uh, understand if your nodes are up or down so that your queries are routed to the nodes which are ready to receive the query. Uh, so it's one plus one point four high availability. And another problem is if you have a database cluster, you don't want to connect on, through, from the application uh, to each and every node. You want to have a single entry point which you can use so that your queries are routed to the database without thinking, right? So these are the problems that we want to solve with proxies. And uh, one of the questions that always rises is why not just use a Kubernetes service for the cluster, right? So you, you have a stateful set. Why don't you just place a service, Kubernetes service in front of it and uh, uh, route the traffic to it? through like layer four TCP proxy? Well, the, 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 there are multiple answers, but there are two things. Uh, first of all, uh, when you talk about databases, you usually have a primary, uh, even if it is a multi-master environment like uh, PXEs, uh, you still need a shoot right to primary only, because uh, if you write to all the nodes, you might uh, get some performance issues because of certification conflicts because all the nodes they will need to talk to each other quickly and tell hey someone wrote something to here someone wrote something to here and it might impact the performance right so we cannot put it at random and the, another thing is if, if you have a proxy where, where you can cache your queries right for example or you can filter them out if you want on the proxy level. So there are multiple reasons why proxy is a good thing. Um, and um, let's move forward. So proxies architecture is kind of straightforward. Again, we want to use Kubernetes primitives as much as possible. So we start with the PXE cluster on the right, in the middle you have proxy ports and then the service. So the traffic goes from left to right. Uh, first, it hits the Kubernetes service, which can be a load balancer, a cluster IP, a node port, whatever you choose. Then it goes into proxies, and then proxies, they route the traffic to the PXC cluster. Some of the details, right? So generic level, um, we want proxies to be highly available. Uh, which means we deploy not one part of a proxy, but multiple of them, and we deploy them with uh, anti-affinity so that they are spread uh, throughout Kubernetes nodes. Uh, we want to have health checks, which means that proxy is aware if the PXC node is healthy or not. We don't want to route the query to the node which is dead, right? It's, it, it kills all the point. And obviously, as I mentioned previously, we want to know who, who the primary is, so where can we write the data? We don't want to write to all nodes, we want to write to the primary only, uh, so we don't have any performance issues. And uh, when we first implemented the proxy in uh, our operator, we started with um, proxy SQL. And uh, proxy SQL, as you might know, is a layer seven. Uh, proxy, which means it looks deep into the queries which you send it, and it can perform caching, it can do query filtering, it can do some other magic, and uh, basically it's a first choice when someone thinks about proxy and MySQL, 
right but then um uh, uh, some problem raised is that uh, when someone uses uh proxy sql then uh, the ip address uh, on the database itself uh, is shown as the ip of the proxy uh right it's not showing the real ip address of the user and that is why we thought okay we, we can solve it uh, with uh, uh, he proxy and proxy protocol and uh, that is why we decided to add he proxy support he proxy and mysql are the best friends forever it's uh, like from day one again everyone is using he proxy apache mysql and uh, yeah he proxy comes with proxy protocol out of the box and uh, even if you run it on some cloud like uh, on amazon uh, uh, elastic load balancers they support proxy protocol they can carry the ip address of the source to he proxy and he proxy carries the source ip to the database so you can uh, do the grants do the audit based on the ip address of the user on the database and it's useful if you are moving your uh, database from the environment uh, i don't know from aurora or from other environment uh, on prem where you were relying on these grants and uh, you want to continue doing that so that is why he proxy and proxy sql uh, sql there are two options that you can always use with our operator and they're all working out of the box um the next thing that i want to highlight is how to recovery from full cluster crash so uh, out of recovery uh, and full cluster crash is an interesting problem and uh, usually this problem arises for, for the database with uh, synchronous uh, replication and the, the use case is simple, right? So you have three nodes in your cluster and all nodes go down simultaneously. Or for example, I don't know, in Kubernetes world, someone can kill all Kubernetes nodes all at once, right? Or there is some network partition, so one node cannot reach the other node. Um, and uh, so they again separated all three nodes, they lost each other. And what's happened happens next is when they come up after the, the restart or the network partition, uh, they don't know who holds the latest data, right? So they, there is no quorum anymore and uh, uh, no one wants to uh, be to blame. No one wants to be the master or the primary node. So they don't know what to do. And uh, BXC node one, two, three, they all say, okay, who has the latest data? I don't know what to do. So this is the full cluster crash. And uh, as I mentioned before, it's, it usually happens in a synchronous replication environment. So what did we do is we came up with a solution for that, uh, which works with PXC and our operator. So as a first step, we have a PXC entry point uh, shell script in our container which is uh, the main entry point and it can detect if there is a full cluster crash it looks at the file uh, some file on uh, local environment he sees this file on the pvc volume and then he tries to connect to the must to, to, to the primary node and uh, there is an issue clearly okay i cannot connect to the primary i don't know who the primary is uh, what to do and it just goes into the loop and still waits for the primary node to appear and uh, the second step is operator says okay all nodes are down they are all in uh, the loop what, what should i do i will find the node with the latest uh, global transaction id global transaction id is a unique transaction identifier but uh, it is unique not only to the server but uh, to the whole cluster and replicated through out the cluster topology right so operator finds the node with the latest gtid and uh, it finds it uh, through the regular uh, pxc functionality every pxc node prints out the uh, latest gtid when it's uh, when it shut down or it can be found in the logs and uh, 
once operator finds it, see, it says, okay, this is the node with the latest GTA ID. I will send SIG user one to it and it will become the primary. And what happens next is uh, PXC entry point uh, on other nodes, it detects that the primary is up and now we know who has the latest data and other nodes starts up. So this is how we can exit from full cluster crash. And uh, um, actually in the Kubernetes world to, uh, to reproduce this full cluster crash, it is just enough to delete all the pods simultaneously, right? And uh, it happened a lot uh, with uh, our users, right? Because uh, it's the normal thing in Kubernetes that you can delete all the pods, the stateful set will recreate them back or deployment will recreate them back. Uh, but for the databases, it's crucial that sometimes you do things more uh, gracefully, right? So you shut down this port first, the next one is that. So this is what where operate, operator comes in handy, right? But again, yeah, users can do such things. They can delete all the pods, the cluster can crash, and uh, our job is to recover automatically from, from such crashes without user interaction. And that is what uh, this uh, feature does. Um, the next thing is version service. Um, and the problem statement here is uh, when, when you run the database cluster uh, and the operator and maybe some other application as well, uh, you want to be sure that the features that you have implemented in the operator are compatible with the software uh, that you run. Like uh, if you implement a point in time recovery and it's not implemented in some MySQL version, then obviously you uh, cannot use it with the operator because the feature will not work. That is why uh, the user needs to know, okay, which version of software of uh, MySQL I should use with this version of the operator, right? And the next thing is we also want to automate software version upgrades, uh, like minor version upgrades of database, for example, like from 5.7.1 to 5.7.2. Obviously, you want to upgrade it easily with no downtime. And the same goes with uh, other database or operator components like proxies and monitoring. If you have some sidecar, like an operator, we run PMM as a sidecar and you run HA proxy. You want to update the Docker image of it seamlessly as well without manual steps. Um, one of the reasons why I want to do it is security features, right? Like some fixes rolled out and some uh, common vulnerability uh, was fixed in the latest MySQL version or HA proxy version. Obviously, you don't want to miss that. And that is where uh, version service should come in handy, right? And uh, we were thinking how to do that. And uh, as a first thing in our head, obviously was, okay, why don't we just ship some JSON file with our operator? And then uh, the user can uh, ask, look into this JSON file or the operator can look into this JSON file and pick the version. Uh, which is compatible with it. But that would require us to keep this JSON file upgraded with each operator version. And also it means that um, we need to wait for the operator to be upgraded so that the user gets the latest versions of the um, MySQL or HE proxy. It doesn't work that way, right? So we decided to uh, create a public uh, check proponent.com it is a, we call it a version service thing. It is an open source software as well. And it can be uh, installed on-prem if uh, there is an air gapped environment, for example, where the user does not trust or check corner.com ships. Uh, it's not a problem. And what it actually does is operator goes to this version service, says, okay, I'm running on this version. And uh, which, what is the recommended version that I should run? And the version service replies, what is the recommended version? And the operator 
uh, then loads the latest Docker images from the repository and uh, then applies them in graceful mode. So it means rolling upgrade one by one with no downtime. And it works, as I mentioned, for proxies, for databases, for PMM, for corner monitoring and management. And again, it can be installed on-prem because uh, it's an open source piece of software. Now let's go into backup and restore. So backup and restore is a big thing here, a uh, big section that I want to cover. And uh, the goals are pretty clear, right? So the, we want, or the user wants to recover from data loss. So I don't know, something was deleted from the database, we need to get it back. Uh, the user wants to recover from full Kubernetes cluster crash, meaning that all the PVCs are gone, everything is gone. So we need to recover somehow like full disaster recovery. And then point in time recovery comes in uh, PITR. Uh, it is where the user wants to reduce uh, recover time objective, um, obviously, right? Um, and, and the reason is clear, right? Uh, if you have full cluster crash, uh, you cannot recover to full backup, which is one day old um, or a few hours old. It's better if you have uh, the backup somewhere uh, like five minutes old at least. Uh, so you don't have any data lost. And the, the problems that we faced when we started to think how to build the, these things is... Um, First is external storage, right? In, 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 in operator, in Kubernetes world, you don't want to store anything locally, even on PVCs, because even PVCs, uh, persistent volume claims, they are ephemeral. A user can just remove them and the data will be lost, right? And uh, um, it's not a good thing. And in cloud native world, uh, everything is stored on uh, S3 compatible storage. Um, and uh, that is where we face the first problems because uh, MySQL, uh, MySQL tools, they are not 100% ready to that to be natively used with uh, S3. Um, another thing is um, multiple nodes in the cluster, right? Imagine you decided to store uh, bin logs locally, right? Um, then uh, how do you know if which which node has the latest because you can scale up easily you can add new node or you can delete the pvc of another node so the bin logs will be deleted and you don't know you 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 cannot maintain this consistency across multiple nodes in the cluster uh with binary logs for example and uh, this all comes in because of uh kubernetes is an ephemeral uh beast right so you have nodes come and go Pods can be deleted, and uh, uh, instead of uh, fixing it, we need just to embrace this uh, chaos, chaos monkey by design. So obviously, the there were some decisions that we made as the first step uh, of our design is uh, we want to have custom resource uh, objects for uh, backup and restore. Uh, again, custom resource objects in Kubernetes, they allow you to extend the API of the Kubernetes. And uh, at the same time, it allows you to keep some state, right? So when when the user wants to create a backup of his PXC cluster, uh, what's happening is PXC backup object is created and then operator does all the magic and you can um, do cube cuddle get pxc backup and you will see all the information about the backup that you just did or if the backup is scheduled you will see too right and the same goes with pxc restore if you do the restore you want to see the state of it was a sex successful restore uh, if it failed why it failed so again we decided to create uh, two custom resource objects one for backup one for restore uh, so uh, the user can easily and manage this process through regular Kubernetes control plane without 
doing any other manual steps. And um, um, we allow storing backups on both existent volume claims and uh, S3 compatible storage. Uh, we want to store backups on PVCs because sometimes it is uh, easier for users and it has better performance or sometimes if the user does not have S3 compatible storage like uh, the cluster is running on-prem somewhere in some data center and there is only I don't know some self storage there you can use it instead of spinning up like MinIO or building your own uh, object storage you can use PVCs. So this is one of the decisions that uh, we made. And for point in time recovery, we from day one, we decided, okay, we're going to use only external storage for binary logs. We don't want to store anything on local volumes. We want to upload binary logs to external storage to make sure that uh, the user is not impacted if uh, the cluster crashed or the database is gone. So we want to have the latest snapshot of the data somewhere externally, right? And uh, by design, we decided that we can split our uh, binary log uh, functionality into two pieces. Uh, one will upload and another one will recover. I will talk about it uh, on the next slides. Um, Another decision that we made for point in time recovery is we're going to rely on uh, uh, global transaction ID. I mentioned it before, and global transaction ID is a, a unique transaction identifier, but is unique not only on the server on which it originated, but it is unique across all servers in a given uh, replication topology. With the global transaction ID captured in binary logs, we can identify any transaction not depending on the file name or its content. It uh, allows us to continue streaming binary logs from any uh, Procorna Extra TV cluster member from any moment. So um, it is important because, again, Kubernetes is. Uh, ephemeral you can scale up you can scale down you can kill the node you can delete the storage anything can happen a well, whole availability zone can go down and uh, it is very important that we always can identify the transactions on various different nodes and we don't need to think about okay this file name is uh, bin log 00111 and this file name has a totally another name so we know where the transaction is, we know what, what is the ID, and we don't care uh, uh, where is it, right? So in here, you can uh, see that um, an insert uh, into users resulted in a GTID, which is propagated on each and every node in different uh, bin log file names, right? And uh, it is an important decision that we made here. Uh, Another one, backup and uh, restore decision for point in time recovery is to use uh, user defined uh, functions for some of the functionality. Because uh, again, <laughs> as we're building it, using the tools that are not ready for cloud native and for this moving parts environment, uh, we uh, had to be creative. And uh, so we have a unique identifier for every transaction, but uh, the utility of my MySQL bin log utility still doesn't have the functionality to determine uh, which binary log file contains which global transaction ID. So it just doesn't know, okay? So, okay, I, I have this binary log, I have GTID, how do I map them together? And uh, uh, what we decided to do is to extend MySQL with uh, some user-defined functions, UDFs, and uh, we added them to Procona server for MySQL and Procona Extra DB cluster into uh, latest versions. And uh, there are two important functions. One of them returns uh, all global transaction IDs that are stored inside 
the given binary log file. We put the global transaction uh, set list to file next to the binary log on S3. So it is easy for, for us to uh, identify uh, where uh, what GTIDs are stored in the bin log file. And another function, it takes global transaction IDs and as input and returns a binary log file name where uh, which is stored locally. So uh, if we don't know which binary log it is, we can easily get it from this function. So yeah, again, we had to be creative here because um, the tools, they are not cloud native ready. And uh, we had actually two choices, whether we contribute the code to uh, MySQL bin lock utility or contribute the code to Procona server for MySQL. And for us, we needed to move faster. So we decided to uh, create the UDFs. And again, it is open source and we are ready if uh, we, we would be happy if someone uses these functions for, for their own use, right? And um, the last part, I believe, here on backup and restore or point in time recovery is we decided to make our uploader pod, which uploads the binary logs to uh, S3 compatible storage, we decided to make it 100% storage less. And there are multiple reasons for that. First of all, we we don't know the size of binary logs, uh, right? Because uh, the size of bin logs depends on the cluster usage patterns. So it's hard for us to predict it. And uh, we don't know how much storage do we need for this pod or how much memory if we want to store it in memory, right? Uh, of course, we understand that it will not be super huge in any way, but we decided not to take the risk. And um, what we're doing here is we are taking all this complexity away by making our bin log upload report completely um, storage less. And how we do it is uh, MySQL bin log utility that I mentioned before, it can uh, store remote uh, binary logs uh, only into files, right? But we need to put them to S3. To get there, we decided to use named file or first in, first out, FIFO uh, special file. Now MySQL bin log, it loads the binary log file to a named file. Our uploader reads it and streams the data directly to uh, S3 compatible storage. So it is a neat solution. And as you see again, as long as the tools are not cloud native ready, uh, we need to be creative here and to find some workarounds to get there and to make them ready, right? Now, uh, I believe it is all about the decisions that we made. Um, let's talk about uh, the plans. So uh, first of all, one of the things that we want to deliver is built-in disaster recovery uh, for multi-region environments. Uh, it means if you have um, a PXC cluster deployed somewhere uh, in Kubernetes in uh, Europe, uh, you probably want to uh, have a disaster recovery uh, version of it somewhere in, in, uh, in, in US or maybe ju in just another country. So it's uh, not enough to have multi-Z deployment, which is supported by Kubernetes in many clouds, but you want another region. And it's a valid use case for disaster recovery, right? And uh, we are working on that. Um, we will deliver it, I believe, uh, in the upcoming release. And the way it's going to work is uh, the user will be able to configure one cluster's main another cluster's replica, or one cluster's main and some other MySQL uh, instance as replica, even if it's not a PXC at all. So it, it will support uh, multi-region uh, synchronization uh, across 
two clusters. We will see if uh, the failover will be automated or not. So there are lots of questions and there are lots of options that we're looking into, but it is definitely an interesting feature and uh, uh, a lot of users and the community want it for sure. Uh, another bullet here is user management through the operator. Again, by design, we at Percona, we see our um, operators as the mean to deploy uh, Percona software for databases on Kubernetes, right? So we just want to deploy it. We want to make sure that the database is up and running. We want to make sure that the infrastructure is provisioned automatically without user interaction. And also we are uh, touching a bit of a management, right? Like scaling up, scaling down, uh, taking backups, scheduling backups, point in time recovery, it all can be done through the operator, right? But sometimes uh, uh, users want more, right? And it's a good thing. Uh, so uh, one of the features that we receive multiple requests for is uh, user management through the operator. Like, hey, I want to create the user uh, with all the crunts using the operator. Uh, so I don't want to go and connect to the endpoint of the database. I just want to create some custom resource object in Kubernetes and the magic is there, the user is created. So we're thinking about that. It is uh, an interesting feature and there are lots of uh, design questions as well. Like, do we want to, uh, have it like a one-way thing. So you create a user in Kubernetes and sync to a database, or we want to have it a two-way thing where you create a user on the database and it also magically appears on Kubernetes as a custom resource. So you keep the state on both Kubernetes and the database. So such questions, they always arise. And uh, the next step there for us uh, would be to understand all the requirements, capture them and create the nice and easy feature. Um, also related to this feature, another thing is um, not only users, uh, user management is required, but sometimes we see requests where users want to manage databases and tables as well. Like, hey, I want to create a stored procedure through the Kubernetes operator without going to, to the, uh, to the uh, database itself. Well, is it a valid use case? Probably. But again, for, for us, the main concern is to automate the infrastructure and database creation, and then we can build uh, something uh, else on top of that. We will think about that. If you have any ideas, please feel free to contact me. We'll be glad to discuss. And uh, the last bullet, I believe, is super important, right? Uh, at the beginning of this talk, I mentioned uh, or I talked about why we chose uh, Percona XDB cluster over regular MySQL because of synchronous uh, replication. And um, now we see that group replication in MySQL version 8 is quite mature. It already provides uh, synchronous replication without Galera, without any other tools, just native MySQL and it is great. And uh, we have a plan to uh, deliver the new operator this year with regular async replication and group replication. Async replication is uh, still sometimes required because not all applications, again, they require synchronous replication. They don't, they, it is okay for sometimes to lose some transactions. So, um, and uh, you don't have any performance penalties with async replication at all. So, this is our plan. So this year we will uh, deliver version two of our operator, which will rely on regular uh, MySQL and group replication. So stay tuned. And also I encourage you to visit our uh, public roadmap, uh, which is, uh, you see the link there. It's on GitHub. You can submit new issues. You can uh, uh, vote for some issues that were submitted there. You can see what we're working on currently, uh, what we want to work on, what is in QA, what was just released. So it's all open source. It's all there, transparent, visible. Feel free to do that. 
So thank you, I guess. I don't have uh, anything else, sorry for the day. Uh, you can find me at Twitter. You can drop me an email. I will be glad to discuss anything related to the database, to Kubernetes, to Procurement software. Thank you again. Bye-bye.